So I'd like to uh, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you here today. We're we're beginning our our uh, recording of this, and so I'd like to welcome all of those who will be watching this uh, by YouTube or in whatever way it comes to you in video form. We'd like for you to know that we're glad that you've joined us and hope that you stay tuned and the Word of God will speak to you. That's why we're here, to hear what the Word of the Lord will say. In John chapter 3 and verse 34, we find these words. For he whom God hath sent speaketh God's words. And the word there for words is rhema. Now the difference, as you know, between logos and rhema is that logos is the divine expression of God's word in whatever form it is. For instance, this Bible would be logos. It is the divine expression of God's word to mankind. But... When this word or any word from God, whether it comes like prophetically by the Holy Spirit or, or out of his word, however it comes into humanity, once it comes into us through our eye gates, through our ear gates, however it comes, then we mix our faith with it and it takes on a human flavor. You see, God made Adam as a container, a carrier, a speaker of God's words in the earth. God didn't put Adam in heaven. He put him on earth because God wanted a vessel in the earth to carry and be responsible for the dispensing of God's word here. God started the process at creation when God came where there was darkness and chaos and, and utter confusion. And in the middle of all that, God said, he issued his word, let there be light. And that began a process of God speaking creation into existence. And then the, the highest apex of God's creation was mankind. And God made that man to take up where God left off when he went back to the, to the heavens because man was God's representative in the earth to carry and speak and propound his word. So that's why Adam was created and that's why Jesus came. Jesus was what? The word made flesh. He was the logos made rhema. <laughs> Because what happens is the word of God that comes into us and then flows out of us, out of our mouth, it, it transitions from logos to rhema, which takes on in the earth, everybody say in the earth, in the earth, earth. In the earth it takes on a power and, and a, a jurisdictional power kind of authority because we are designed to be here. Your body's made from this planet. Mm -hmm. And God breathed his spirit in you so we are earth part, heaven part which causes the processor our soul, our mind, our will, our consciousness to become a conscious and awake and then we are able to connect heaven and earth. That's how God made us to, to be. God's word coming to earth, and then being dispensed in earth. That was the whole process. It was all about God's will for the earth. What was, what was the last thing Jesus said before he left the Garden of Gethsemane? If it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. That's my will. I'd like to avoid this. That was the flesh part. But, oh, thank God. Yes. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And what was God's will? That the earth once again receive the word of God. Like it was at first. Now, both Adam and 
Jesus. That's my phone in the briefcase. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, happy oh hey! To you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Terry. Happy birthday to you and many more. <laughs> Make sure you watch this show. Oh, there you go. It's Thursday. <laughs> Thursday? Yes. Yes. <laughs> How many? Psalmist of Israel said, 
the Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. That's what David said. That was before Pentecost. David said, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. That's not strange. That's not weird. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's the way God made it to be. Amen? Mm -hmm. You are a carrier of God's word. Now, time from time to time, an angel may show up with a word from God. They've done it throughout the scriptures. But that's not God's basic mode of operation in the earth. Though there are times when God had to send a special message through a special heavenly messenger. But that's not God's main way of doing it. God wants to speak to you by His Spirit. And that Spirit then puts the word in you. What did Mary say when the angel came and spoke into her ear gates? He said, you're going to have a son. He's going to call his name Jesus. He's going to be the Savior of his people. The, the, the power of the highest will overshadow you. You shall conceive in your womb, bear a son. What did she say? So be it unto me according to thy word. In other words, I've received your word. I'm mixing my faith with it. That's what's going to come out of my mouth. And I'm going to do just exactly what you said. That's God's intention for planet Earth. Now, the sweet psalmist of Israel, before Pentecost, said the Spirit speaks. And God's word is in my tongue. That's the way God meant for it to be. That's Rhema. That is Rhema. In Acts chapter 3, verse 21, He spake by the mouth of His prophets since the world began. Guess what? He spake by the mouth of His prophets. That's a pretty clear statement, y'all. He's doing the speaking, but it's their mouth that it's coming out of. Why? God's in the heavens. You are here. Here is where the word needs to go forth. Hey, heaven's settled. The writer said, forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. There's no ifs, ands, or buts there. It's all settled. Here is where it needs to be settled. Here's where the battle is. Here's where the war is raging. And the remedy, the solution, the antidote is God's word. Always has been and is today. When the earth was in chaos, when God first showed up, he used his words to bring order out of the chaos. Let, guess what? There's a lot of chaos and darkness in the world today. It's still God's word that will create order out of the chaos. Mm -hmm. We have to learn and prepare ourselves to be the mouth of God. That sounds egotistical. It sounds, uh, you know, like who do you think you are? But I'm just saying... God made it this way. It's not our design. It's His design. Amen. We need to recognize it, understand it, and go with it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. In John chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus said, The Father which sent me, He gave me commandment of what I should speak. And even as the Father said unto me, So I Speak. That's pretty clear. He made me to bring the word here. And that's all I'm going to speak to you. The word. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. In Acts chapter 2 verse 24. Pentecost has happened. Jesus said, when, when, it's expedient for me. It's expedient for you that I go away. Because if I don't go back to the Father... You can't, you can't have the Holy Spirit come. So when I get there, I'll pray the Father, and he'll send him back to you, the other comforter, the, the, the 
who is the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God. So on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit showed back up on the planet, we see, and they began to speak with other tongues. Now see, we've gotten caught up on the glossolalia phenomenon, which is the unknown tongues, or the, the speaking, what we call speaking in tongues. And I'm not in the least bit uh, 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 trying to negate that whatsoever. That was a very real part of the outpouring of the Spirit. But, the word here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4 says they began to speak with other tongues. Speak here uh, in other tongues, the word here that translates that out of the Greek is altered tongues or different tongues. And in Mark chapter 16 verse 17 says they shall speak with new tongues. And the word is translated renewed tongues. What God's trying to do is put us back where we were when he created us in Adam. He's trying to put power and authority back in our mouth through our words, which is his words coming through us. Now, the altered or the different or the renewed tongue means to have the same authority, the same anointing, the same ability as Adam had. Well, see, when God would come and walk with Adam in the cool of the day in the garden, well, what was he doing? He was teaching him. Mm -hmm. He was instructing him as a father does a son so that Adam would understand how to call the animals by their name, for instance, and to have dominion and subdue the earth with his words. Adam never sweat until he sinned. He wasn't out there making the earth bring forth and bud. He spoke to it. Just like Jesus spoke to it, who is the last Adam. Jesus spoke to the storms. Jesus spoke to the fig trees. Jesus spoke uh, to, to, to things. He didn't speak about things. He spoke to things. He spoke to them. He talked about them too. But what I'm saying is, he came to put the word back in the earth. And when the Holy Spirit came, he came to put the word back in our mouths and put our mouths back in order. <laughs> so we quit speaking and, and, and quit prospering our enemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like most people do. Mm -hmm. Even religious people, they prosper the devil all the time. Mm -hmm. Brag on what he's doing. Tell him what he's done. You can go to a, we used to have testimony services on Wednesday night and over the years in churches, you know, as I was growing up. And, and the people get up and spend most of the time, their testimony was not of the greatness and goodness of God. It was about what the devil had been doing to them yeah, all. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. that's true. Glorifying the devil. Now, who was being glorified by that? Yeah. See? And they thought they were just having a wonderful testimony service, but... You gotta, you gotta go by the principles of God's word. When you stand up to testify, you need to say what God said. Amen. Mm -hmm. If you didn't say what God said, then what you said wasn't worth listening to. That's right. Amen. Amen. Now, in Mark, uh, or rather, in John chapter sixteen, verse thirteen, he says this: "And whatsoever," this is talking about the Holy Spirit, "and whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak." If he's in me and he hears from the heavenlies, that's what he's going to speak in me. And that's what my mouth has to say. See, when the Holy Spirit came, he did not make robots out of those people. He simply gave them the anointing and the inspiration and the gifting to do what they were made to do to begin with. He didn't make a bunch of robots out of them. They were not out of control. They were yielded. Yielded. 
We don't know how to yield to the Holy Spirit. But that's a whole different, that's a whole different lesson. In uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 17, once the Spirit had fallen, and these people had started speaking with new, new tongues, new mouths, there was new authority in what they were saying, guess what? It really upset the status quo. It really upset the religious system. And they immediately started getting their committees and their groups together and trying to find a way to stop this. Now, who do you think was behind that? If I was the devil, I'd want it stopped because I would know that's going to be the end of me if I let them go on doing that. Amen. Mm -hmm. You can say, well, but they were the church of the day, and they were. Mm -hmm. In name. And guess what? That's what religion is today. Mm -hmm. You see, we're either spirit-driven or flesh-driven. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're spirit driven, guess what? It is the Holy Spirit's agenda. It is His agenda. It is the Word of God. It, it is all about the, 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 what Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. But if you're flesh driven, listen, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, God came to the garden, Adam, where are you? It's interesting he didn't ask Eve. And I'm not going to go any further with that. He asked Adam. He asked Adam, where are you? And Adam said, we were afraid and we hid ourselves because we heard your voice. Mm -hmm. And Adam said, and we hid ourselves because we were naked. And God said, who told you you were naked? And again, he didn't ask Eve. He asked Adam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said... Who told you you were naked? And then he didn't wait for Adam's answer. He said, did you eat of the tree? Look out. And he said, she did. <laughs> and she gave it to me, and then I did. Okay. Pastor, 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 you know what's so funny? What? Man was created, I've always said to a lot of people, this is to glorify woman. Man was created, created ahead of woman to protect her and cherish her. But what's the first thing that happens when things go wrong? He hides behind her. The blame game. <laughs> <laughs> it's her fault. Yeah. Yeah. He's a coward. He was a coward. I didn't do it. She did it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. The fact is, now get this. Their priority was no longer spiritual matters. It was flesh matters. They covered themselves up. From that point on, after they sinned, they were flesh-driven and not spirit-driven. Do you see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. The whole world is born that way in Adam. We're born flesh-driven creatures. It is not until you get born again that you understand the spirit-driven life. You see that? Yes. Okay, let's go on. In Acts uh, 4.17, and that it spread no further, they threatened them that they henceforth speak no more in that name. And the word speak there is rhema. <laughs> now look, in Acts 4, go on, let's go on down a little bit more in Acts when they beat them and threatened them, then the disciples went to God, verse 429 of Acts, and now, Lord, behold their threats and grant unto us boldness to speak. What was their threat? Don't speak anymore. And what was the disciples' prayer? Lord, give us boldness to speak. It was all about the speaking. The world is still trying to shut up righteous words. Yes, 
Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Go on down in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. When they had prayed, the place was shaken, and they spake the word of God with boldness. They threatened them, don't, don't talk like this anymore. They go to God, pray, Lord, give us boldness to talk like this. They prayed, the place was shaken, and all of a sudden, the Spirit inspired them to speak the word of God with boldness. See, the, see here? What the devil's trying to do and what God's trying to do? Look at Acts chapter 5 verse 12. They put them in prison this time because they wouldn't stop talking. They put them in prison. God sent an angel and the angel opened the prison and said, Go stand and speak. Go stand and speak. Don't let them stop you from speaking. So they went out and started speaking some more. Started spreading the word again. And then in Acts chapter 6 verse, verse 10, a deacon, not he wasn't even an apostle, a deacon named Stephen got so inspired, he went out, boy, and standing on a street corner saying stuff. The evil spirits rose up in those people. And the Bible says here in verse 10, Acts 6, they were not able to withstand the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. And in verse uh, 12 and 13, Acts chapter 6, so because these people couldn't stop speaking, stop Stephen from speaking, and, and they couldn't overcome his words because the spirit... What was in him was stronger than the spirit was in, the, in them. So they stirred up the people and set up false witnesses. That's still going on today. <laughs> people still get stirred up and false witnesses get set up. Amen. One of the big players in the last days is the false prophet. What is he doing? He's talking. Ryan. He's trying to put out his words Ryan. so you won't believe God's word. Ryan. Amen. Amen. Now listen. In John chapter 6 verse 63, Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you are spirit and they are life. And the word, words, is rhema. Jesus said, I am speaking rhema. It is Filled with spirit and life. That's what rhema is. There's a spirit in those words. There is life in those words. They don't just fall to the ground and become dormant. They penetrate and they make a difference. Because they're alive. They're seeds. They're seeds. They're seeds. Now, remember our title. The sword and the sea. Okay? Three times in the wilderness when Jesus was being confronted by Satan. Satan was tempting him. Three times. All three temptations. Jesus, the word, said it is written. He knew what had been written by the prophets. And throughout Jesus' life, I dare you to do a study on this sometime. Throughout Jesus' life, he was meticulous. He was detailed in being sure that everything he did, every place he went, everything he said was in alignment and in fulfillment of what had been prophesied. Amen. Why? Because God's word is not to be broken. Amen. 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 Okay. Now, Hebrews 4 and 12 says this, that the word of God is quick and powerful. It's a sharp two-edged sword. It says it's sharp. It says it's got two edges. It says it's living. It's powerful. <laughs> it pierces. It divides. It discerns. And it's a sword. Now, the word that is used there is logos. 
It says the word that God has given is two-edged sword. It's sharp. It's powerful. It pierces. It divides. It discerns. But what happens when that logos comes into us, into humanity, we are designed to handle that word. See, demons and devils are not designed to speak words Amen. in the earth. They're not made for that. It takes a special emissary from God, a heavenly angel, to come and bring a word. Other than that, every time Jesus was dealing with devils, he told them to shut up and come out. Don't want to hear what you got to say? Yeah, you man. just lie anyhow. <laughs> Hold your peace. Come out. Amen. 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 Angels are not designed for that. Just like God needs you and me to speak rhema in the earth because we wear an earth suit. We're designed and legal residents of earth. Demons and devils, even Satan himself, is an alien, a foreigner. He does not belong here. This is not his earth. And the only reason he has any rights here is because Adam gave it to him. The man uh -huh. gave it to him. If a man gave it to him, a man's going to take it back, and Jesus did. He is the last Adam, and he took it back yeah. and gave it to you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Now here's the thing. The devils and the demons have no permission and no right to say anything. But they use voices just like God does. They possess people. Amen. They oppress people. Amen. And they obsess people. Amen. That's the three dimensions of spiritual activity. Oppression, obsession, and possession. That's the reason God sent the Holy Spirit to inhabit us. So that he would be present in us to inspire us to speak. Amen. His words, God's Amen. word. Rhema, rhema, rhema. Logos becomes rhema. That sharp two-edged sword gets in your mouth when you consume this word and it comes out of your mouth. Amen. It doesn't become a sword until you say it. Yes, sir. Hello! Yes, sir. Amen. <laughs> it says a two-edged sword. The word two-edged is translated from, from the Greek word dis, distomos, which is actually a combination of two words. Di-stomos. Di-stomos. Distomos. Which means two mouths. God saying, saying that, 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 that this two-edged sword uh, is going to give us two mouths? <laughs> you have a natural mouth, but you also have a spiritual mouth. Amen. Hello? Amen. Mm -hmm. You speak natural things, but you also speak spiritual things. Amen. Somebody asked you a question. Uh, how do you get to that place? Well, just naturally, you're going to say, well, you go down Sigmund Road, and you come to this road, and you turn left, and you go down to the next line, and you this and that and the other. So that's natural. It's a mouth. But when you are speaking rhema, it is a spiritual transaction that makes your mouth a sword. Do you understand that? Yeah. And it says that this word pierces even to the dividing asunder. Joints and marrow. Amen. The word piercing there is translated to penetrate, to invade, to impregnate. Now listen, In Ephesians 6, 17 says, Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Who is supposed to take it up? We are. 
We are to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That means it's supposed to be in us. Amen. And we are supposed to speak the rhema of God in the earth. We have the sword. Somebody say, well, I thought Jesus had the sword. He does. But so do you. Because you're in him. Yeah. He's in you. Amen. He is the firstborn of many brethren. Yeah. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Yeah. He is the savior. Yeah. 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 And he saved you. And now you're a child of God. You're in him. You're not worthy. Amen. Quit trying to think you are. You're not. <laughs> but he is. And he gave you his righteousness and took your sin and didn't even ask you for permission. <laughs> he just asked you to accept it. And you did. That's why you got born again. Now listen. In Isaiah 49 too, Isaiah, even in the Old Testament, said, He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. Amen. Revelation chapter 116, talking about Jesus. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. What is that? That's the word of God. Amen. In Revelation 2.12, he is talking to the church using John. And, and the Bible says, These things saith he that hath the sharp two-edged sword. Amen. Where is it? It's in his mouth, not in his hand. You don't think about a sword being in your mouth. It's supposed to be in your hand, but not this sword. Revelation 2.16. Jesus, once again, speaking to the churches in the book of Revelation, he says, and I will come and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Amen. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth, but a sword. What kind of a sword? The word sword in that scripture is translated matyra. That's exactly the sword that Paul says in Ephesians, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Because he was describing the Roman soldier's armor, and he talked about the helmet and the shoes and the breastplate and the shield and all that. And, and what he was talking about was the Machira sword, which is not the big, broad sword. And it's not, there was about six different swords that they used. But this one was the one that was kept in the girdle which Paul called the girdle of truth. And this was a short sword that was for up close and personal combat to look in the whites of the eyes of your opponent. Yes, and it was not for slashing and cutting. It was for stabbing and piercing. That's the reason the Bible says that it's a sharp two-edged sword. And it did have two edges. But it was a sword that pierced and even to the dividing asunder. Right? In other words, it pierced all the way to the bone. Amen. See what I'm saying? That's what the word is supposed to do. You speak this word into a situation, that, like the situation with the questions I asked you before we started. You speak this word into those situations and it pierces to the heart of the matter. Yes, sir. And sows the seed. I have a hypodermic needle. Somebody said, that's a big honking needle. And it sure is. Keep that away from my butt. You have to. It's brand new. I haven't, I haven't used it. But it's, 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 it's got two openings on the side of it here. And you you it's designed so, so that you can use it in cooking. Like you take this and fill it up with whatever you like, some, some buttery sauce or something like that, mm -hmm. and, and, and you just poke it right down in the breast of that turkey and just inject it right mm -hmm. into the turkey. Yes, it is. Oh, but, it's, <laughs> but, it's, but it's also designed where it has a barrel that's big enough and the, the hollow uh, point of it here is designed so that you could take a small seed like a mustard seed and put it in whatever liquid's in here. And when you inject the fluid out of here into whatever you, like you put it, roast. inject it into a roast or into a turkey or into to, to whatever, 
the seed will come out, it's big enough to come out with, with the fluid as it comes out. Listen, when you go to the doctor, he uses one lot smaller than this, thank God. Better. <laughs> but that's exactly what he does to you, or has the nurse to do it. She takes either your posterior or your arm, and she takes a, a needle, she pokes it in you, and then she puts what's in the barrel of that needle into you, and it goes in there, and it's a seed for your healing. I mean, it's not like a seed for it's It's usually a fluid, but it acts as a seed. It causes antibodies. If it's an antibiotic, it causes antibodies to be formed by your own body and bring healing to wherever you need healing at in your body. It acts as a seed, but you have to pierce with it because it's never going to do any good as long as it's laying on the table or if it's just in the doctor's hand and he talks to you about it, that's wonderful. But until you take it and you pierce something with it and inject with it, then the seed didn't get in there that's going to make anything change. This word is a seed. And it's also a sword. That's the reason for my title. The sword and the seed. This is a sword that pierces, but it's also got seed in it. So when you pierce to the heart of a matter with the word, you inject the truth there, and it is a seed that will produce change. Amen. 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 Can you see that? Amen. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Listen. I have a little visual here. This, for all of you to see, is called a garden dibber. That's a, a British word. I think that's where it originated in Great Britain. It's called a garden dibber. D-I-B-B-E-R. A garden dibber. Those who use this instrument will take it, put seeds in it of whatever kind they want, they will take the top handle here, put their foot on this bottom uh, part down here, this footrest, and they will like stand on it or press it into the ground and pierce the ground. And then the, there's a, a little lever that they can pull and the seed will be released into the hole that punctured the ground. Some seeds need to be planted deeper than other seeds. Some seeds are shallow. Now, they make these dibbers in small, portable things, maybe maybe not even as hardly as long as this, this piece of paper here. And you hold it in your hand, you just poke it in the ground, drop a seed in it, and, and go on about your business. But it's called a dibber because what it does is it punctures and it sows. That's what the word is designed to do. That's why it's called a sword, and that's why the the, the book of, uh, uh, of Matthew and the book of Mark and the book of Luke all give us the mother of all parables where Jesus teaches the sower soweth the word. Amen. So it's a sword and it's a seed. Amen. The sword punctures to the heart of the matter, and the seed injects into the heart of the matter and is sown there to make a difference. Amen. Amen. Do you see that? Amen. That's why we need to know this Logos. Amen. Because if you're full of it and you come across somebody that's in desperate in need of something, out of the abundance of your heart, the sword will pierce into their situation and plant a seed of solution. Amen. Somebody say a seed of solution. Seed of seed of solution. solution. Jesus on the boat. The yes, disciples sir. were afraid. Yes, sir. The storm was raging. The boat was filling with water. They were desperate. They had needs. They cried to the Lord. Awakened Him out of His sleep. He stood up. Come on. And with the sword of his mouth, he pierced the storm and sowed a seed in it. It was called a seed of peace. Amen. 
Amen. He said, Peace! Yes, sir. Be still. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. And all of a sudden, like a little puppy at your feet, it laid down and licked his hand. Amen. <laughs> he pierced it with his word. And the seed of his word produced a harvest. The Bible says, and there was, first of all, in describing it, it says there was a great storm. Yes, sir. But once he said this, the word described it, it says, and there was a great calm. Amen. That's Amen. A mega storm and a mega calm. Hallelujah. Why? Because that storm got pierced yes. by the sword of God's word yes. and a seed got planted and it could not resist the seed of God's word. Amen. 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 Jesus spoke to a fig tree. Yes, did the same thing. Penetrated the roots of yes, that sir. tree. Yes, sir. Jesus penetrated the tomb of Lazarus. Yes, sir. Yes. God penetrated the darkness with his word. Jesus, God, God put his word, his promise in Joshua and in the children of Israel. And for seven days they marched around and said nothing. But on the seventh day they said what God said to say. They released the sword of their word and it brought those walls down. The sword of the word penetrated those walls and the seed of God's word, that promise, brought them down. Yes, sir. Just like he said. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes. Jesus penetrated a legion of demons with his words. Amen. And they went running into the pigs and expired. And the man 